Welcome back to the Morning Show here on the Rise News. I am Ade Sua Omoroan. And I'm Rafa Hussaini. Great to have you again, Rafa. Great to have you as always, Ade Sua. Well, the actions and conduct of government, business and community leaders are the real factors that could affect brand credibility of a country. There is now more than ever the need for increased awareness among stakeholders, uh, both in the private and public sectors, of just how important and relevant the value of a country's brand can influence international relations and economic development. Well, Udeme Ufot, Group Managing Director, SO and U Group, joins us now to discuss this and more. Welcome to The Money Show. Thank you very much. Welcome once again, sir. Thank you. So let's start with this, because this is a very extensive interview. Let, let's start on that lecture uh, that you're telling me about, that you're supposed to give on the 12th of you know, about July, about the synergy and the friendship of an Akwaibo man and a man from Southern Kaduna. And let's juxtapose that with the national narrative today. Thank you. Um, I went to school in Ebi Uzaria in the late 70s. It was my first time up north. And it, uh, my first day on campus, I met a young man, Jerry Buhari, from Kachia in Kaduna State. And from that day, we struck up a very close friendship. We were roommates for four years in university. And we became more like brothers. And uh, I think the high point of that friendship was when I had a little crisis in school and um, there was something that should have been signed off for me. And I wasn't on campus to sign it off. And I told the professor, head of department, that Jerry had signed it off on my behalf. And the prof says, how are you sure he did it? I said to him, if he said he did it, he did it. I would trust him with my life. That's how close we were. And so when, uh, as we've grown up, I look at the country today, and we have these divisions across ethnic lines, and the distrust has built up so much um, between North and South, talks of Fulani, House of Fulani, um, domination and all that, and suspicion all, all along, and you wonder, where did, how did this start? Is it impossible that we can live together in peace and unity as one nation? Of course, it's not impossible. My relationship with Jerry is an example. And um, we are beyond friends, we are brothers. His uh, son lived with me during his national service year. You know, got a job staying in my house, worked, lived in my house, he got his own place to stay in. And that's how close we are. My nephew lived with him when he went to ABU. That's how we've, we've, we've had a relationship. So there's great potential for us as a country if we can really focus on what we call our unity and diversity and build on that. The challenge for us, unfortunately, is that we tend to focus more on those things that divide us instead of trying to focus on and build on those things that unite us as a people. Well, and what are those things that divide us? Because some people will say, you know, those things that should actually unite us, such as the diverse ethnic groups, the religions that we have that should unite us are the ones dividing us. Do you agree? It's subject to interpretation. And let me put it this way. Uh, my view sometimes about Nigerians and religion, whether Christians or Muslims, we tend to have imported some of the traditional beliefs in, you know, in our traditional religions into Christianity and Islam. Uh, what you see happens when Pentecostal churches reflects that, where people are going to some levels of superstition, all in the name of Christianity. In the same vein, the major religions talk about love, tolerance. Bible says to you, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I want to listen to an imam preach. And honestly, on radio, at the end of that sermon, it could have been a Christian pastor preaching because the values he was espousing were essentially the same as Christian values. So where is the source of the division? It's just our selfishness. It's just people manipulating the system for their own advantage, playing on our primordial sentiments to bring up those things that will divide us because 
like the, like the colonial, colonialists would do, is about divide and rule. And so when you put people in contention, you write above those things, and you take advantage of them. You know, if you look at, you know, in, in politics, the man contests elections, he loses, and he says, because I, I don't come from a particular place, or whatever, whatever, or he wants something he cannot get, and he says, because I don't come from a particular place. It's not impossible, it's not to be ruled out completely. But the point is, even in the competition for, for assets, for resources, if all of us fall back to focus more on our competencies, driven by a passion for excellence, no matter who we are, where we come from, we would excel. I'm in the advertising industry. I come from a quiet boom state. No one from where I come from has done what I have done. But that hasn't stopped me from building one of the best marketing communications groups in Nigeria. And I said to my staff, I have no apologies for where I come from. There's no regret, but I, I didn't choose where I come from. But must I fail because of that? No, I cannot fail. Don't, don't you think, sir, that successive governments in this country also heightened this level of division with the term called federal character? Because that term was coined in the 70s in this country about when you were in the university. And the word federal character came about that, oh, it must go round across many groups. So even if there is no competence, as long as it is seen to have a federal character, you want to talk in the lines of that? Well, I mean, the concept of federal character, in my view, was well intended. It's actually been a problem the way it's been executed. You know, again, all of us grew up with some understanding of our differences. Again, I talk about, you know, you need in diversity. Um, I mentioned to you when we, when we spoke earlier, my first time in Zaria, I looked around the environment. When I got home for my first holiday, I said to my friends, if you think there's poverty out here in Calabar, you guys ain't seen nothing. I saw the level of poverty in the north that shocked me as a young person. The challenge is that people don't travel around. And that's where the NYC really helped matters also. Now, besides poverty, certain parts of the country would need some leverage to adjust and some encouragement. And that's what national character is supposed to do. But even beyond national character, there's also the principle of true federalism, which the politicians have campaigned in the last few years. Let each part of the country grow at its own pace. Let them use their resources. Put something at the center to support the entire nation. And let the only those critical areas that must be controlled by the federal might be controlled by the federal might. If the states or the regions look inwards and structure themselves to grow by contributing to the center, I think the, the tensions of who gets what and the pressures of who want to be president will be removed. At the end of the day, why do you have these challenges? We have the challenges because when you are president, you hold the knife and you hold the cake. The Nigerian presidency is so powerful. And so if you don't have a leader that is truly dispassionate and wants to preside over the country with a clear understanding of our diversity and the tinderbox risk we hold if we don't manage those diversities right, then you have challenges. Unfortunately for us, we have a serious deficit when it comes to leadership. Because people just spring up and want to lead the country. But those qualities that are required to hold a diverse country like us together, they lack those qualities. What are those qualities? For one, a true leader must be inspirational. You must look out for those things that will bring your people. It's like leading an organization. A country is simply, to me, a big organization. It starts from the family. You have these functional families where the father just can't hold the family together. You have communities where the local chief is a failure. 
So you transpose that to the national level. You also have a country where the president may not have the skills to inspire, to forge unity, to build understanding, to build consensus, and move the country together of one mind and one spirit. So you need a leader that is truly a leader and can for people to, to focus on doing those things that will advance the purpose of the larger group. Uh, do you have more qualities? Because you just said it must be inspirational. Yes. What are the other qualities you must possess? You must be an astute manager of people and resources. You know, you see, where do the challenges come from? It's in the distribution of resources, where certain people feel cheated, whether in the distribution of offices, or uh, in the allocation of projects and whatever. I mean, the leader must have that sense that, look, I need to balance these things because he would, of course, bring certain concerns amongst and, this, and, and, and discomfort. But importantly also, mm -hmm. especially where we are right now, I think the leader must be a good economic manager. We'll bring that to practical terms, uh, but let's talk about the actions and the perceptions of leaders. Um, about a week ago, the UK warned its citizens uh, against traveling to 21 states in Nigeria. Nigeria has 36 states. Uh, and then just on Tuesday, the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, in the US told the Nigerian community that, you know, some of the stories, uh, some of the things we're encountering, like a kidnapping, are not entirely true. And then he goes on to say, you know, the social media has a way of making everything hysterical, and also assures them that government is on top of the situation. You are a guru in brand and marketing communications. Would you say that the vice president was trying to repair a bad image, or was he just selling the image of Nigeria? In your own opinion, what do you think the vice president was trying to do, and what really is a country image? Well, you know, we need to be careful. Uh, when, when the president went to Singapore some, uh, during his first term and declared to the international community how corrupt Nigeria was and how broke the country was, you know, uh, it caused certain reactions. And we criticized him. Now the VP has gone to the U.S. and tried to play, out the play down the rhetoric mm. about how insecure Nigeria is. And we are attacking him. Yes, there should be some balance, you know. Um, my view is that in most instances, the perception of international media about Nigeria is simply an extrapolation of the contents of the local media. Yes, sensational news is what, what sells, but we need to be careful about our national interest in forgetting some of these things. I think sometimes we overplay it and, of course, fall victim in the hands of international mischief makers. And I'll give you an example. In that same report you just mentioned, I'm from Akwaibom State. Akwaibom was mentioned as one of the states listed as dangerous. In the 21 states. Yeah, one of the 21 states, yes. I'm on average in Akwaibom State at least twice a month. And at a point, I tried to advise the governor that he's been having on and on about how safe Aquabom State is. Lay it down so you don't get mischief makers who want to make you look bad. The point is that there have been several reports on Aquabom that indicate that Aquabom is one of the most peaceful states in the country. Two days before that report was put out, the commissioner of police in the states I said that in about nine months, there was no report of violent crime in the states. He was happy he came to the state with a mandate to ensure peace and security. And he felt he had delivered. Now, that is the state you are saying is listed as a no go area. I don't know about our problems, I don't know about the others. But the point is that some of those reports, someone sits somewhere, picks up. Nigerian newspapers and does a report without setting foot into the country. We'll come back to continue on this issue because it's very pertinent, but we'll have to go on a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. You're watching The Morning Show here on Arise News, and we still have with us the Group Managing Director 
um, of SO and Geo Group, uh, Mr. Odeme Ufo. Thank you for staying with us. Before that break, we were talking about the report I had mentioned earlier about the UK and the Nigerian Vice President, you know, trying to repair this image. And you were citing an example of your state, which is one of those 21 states. So you were saying well, how about do that. we get it wrong? What's, what's wrong in the mix? How do we portray it that, you know, that narrative is wrong about Nigeria? I, as I said earlier, the, the narrative about Nigeria is driven essentially by local media. And we all owe it to ourselves, looking at our national interests, that no matter how bad things may be, we must also find the positive stories about Nigeria to project to the world. Uh, if we continue to focus more on the negatives, all that the world will do is speak on those negatives and amplify those negatives. Um, it's like the drum beats said earlier on. If you, as you beat your drums, so will people dance to the beat. Nigerian media has tended to focus on those negative things about Nigeria, play down on the, on the good parts, and the foreign media see that as, that is the trend, so they plug into that. And of course, international media owes us nothing. Whether we go up or we go down, that's none of their business. We owe it to ourselves. So we must try to make put a focus on the things that work. But beyond that, beyond that, let's get to brass tacks. You cannot contrive a brand. You cannot conjure a brand. A good brand comes from a good product. So beyond what I've said about holding the media accountable for positive reportage, governments, the Nigerian people also, owe it to themselves to try as much as possible to project good things, do good things in the country, you know? There's no doubt that there are good things happening here and there, but they're not ahead of, you see? Nothing sells like bad news. But how do you do that in a country where history was taken out of the curriculum? Yeah. Mm. How do you do that in a country where, I say and I quote, when the Portuguese came in the 1500s, they were marveled at the level of development in the Benin Empire. The Benin Empire had street lights. How do you do that in a country where one of the longest walls in the world, even before the Great Wall of China, span across the Benin Empire? That is not told. How do you do that in a country where all of that is not told to generations yet unborn? Well, if I honestly am. Um... You got me there. Mm. You got me. I've asked that question myself. I've had to say at the level of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, where I'm a board member, that um, we need to take another look at our educational curriculum. I have kids who went to international schools in Nigeria, who to my shock, at secondary school level, we never thought about Herbert Macaulay. Mm. They were taught about Otto, Von Bismarck, about Napoleon, you know? Something about the Second World War from the British perspective. But well, they know nothing about Nigeria. And you see, when you look at this as being, they grew up probably to become the elite of the country. Because for those kids, they finish secondary school in Nigeria at best, and they move abroad. And nobody will teach them Nigerian history in, in any American university or European university. So they are really foreigners in their minds. Something went wrong after the 60s. We need to go back to that. My view is that the entire educational system in Nigeria needs to be, over, needs to be overhauled. Even if you are running a private institution in Nigeria, with the British curriculum, with American, government must insist that a priority course in all the schools must be Nigerian history. You see, I went to St. Vimba's College at Coca, and there was a particular class every week that the founder of the school, Father Slattery, took. And it was considered the most important class in that school. What was the class? It was on attitudes, civics, citizenship. It was about building and inculcating values in young people. 
That was a class you could never miss in St. Fimbas College. And Father Slattery took that class himself. We've focused on the wrong things. And I think if we build a curriculum that is suited towards the kind of Nigerians that we want to create, they can make a difference. And if you don't know where you are coming from, which is what history does for you, you don't know where you are coming from, you can't know where you are going. You don't even know who you are. So it's absolutely important that we look back in our curriculum and give history its pride of place. You know, because it might, it's maybe going back to today's digital world where young people are more outward looking. Mm. And they know what's going on even in their, in their, in their neighborhood. I, I agree with you that we might be focusing on the wrong things. Because when you look at the UK, I mean, knife attacks are on the increase, acid attacks mm. are on the increase. Only God knows how many people are shot dead in the US on a daily basis by guns. In India, mm -hmm. it's gang rape that is becoming an epidemic. Over 50,000 on the yearly basis. Yes, but you see, they still have a positive. Yeah. In, in South Africa, it's yeah. is, is criminality rape, and crime rape, as rape well. Rape by the minute. But Africa. this country is to find a way to have a positive image. And, you know, apart from the media, there must be something else we are not getting right. And how do we do that? I, I read somewhere where you once said, the creative industry has the power to change the narrative of Africa and culture. Can we apply that to this brand? How do we build the credibility of Nigeria's brand? Again, you look at these countries and there are many challenges, but they still have that positive outlook. You see, the countries who have managed to excel despite their downsides, are countries that operate with a good understanding of the power of the brand. Um, I'm afraid to say that a lot, of, a lot of our leaders are brand illiterates. They just don't understand. You know, even when they try to invest in brand building, either they get quacks to do it, or they go off and import foreigners who really cannot understand our culture, they may be good in broad strategy, but for you to communicate with the people, it must resonate and connect with them. Nobody can connect with Nigerians better than Nigerians. And so when you have leadership that don't understand or appreciate the power of brand building, this is what you get. And you see, brand building is not about creating slogans or having some fancy narratives. It starts from the basic foundations. You build a brand like you build a house, brick by brick. And so we need to come to an understanding. Some people have said, maybe you must, you must go on a national retreat mm -hmm. to decide as a nation what do we want to be? Who do we want to be? How do we want to go about it? Luckily for us, in this day and age, there's so much information. We can see how other countries moved. From at Singapore, we say it, from third world to first world within a generation. Is it possible? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Other countries have done it, and we've seen it being done. Even our neighbors next door in Ghana are doing some things right. They may not be perfect, but they are doing some things right. There's so much we can learn from, but the most important thing that our leaders need to focus on what is very, very important beyond just building infrastructure or financing those infrastructure. We've had ministers, and even the last uh, minister, uh, Alajalai Mohammed, uh, trying to rebrand you know, the image of the country. We came up with so many strategies. There was the great people, great nation, um, by Nigeria, and all of that. You know? But people would say these were just slogans, and that's why they did not have any effect. Do you agree? Well, or are we just looking at quick fixes? Were those quick fixes? All our attempts at brand building as a nation so far have been pure sloganeering. You can't build a brand without the buy-in of the CEO. For Nigeria, the CEO is the president. Mm. Does the president believe in the brand building effort? Does he understand? And is he willing to commit to it? If what is your view on that question? I don't know. I've not asked him about it. But, but I, I want, uh, so that for the benefit of people listening, I, I want you to make a distinction between sloganeering mm. and holistic brand building. So at least we can start to have a semblance of a roadmap as we this. Maybe a buy-in. Are you an analogy? 
When you want to build a brand, mm. you sit with the owner, let me call it, of the product. And you come to an agreement on what that brand should represent to an identified target audience. You need to agree that. And once you've agreed, you now say to yourself, how do we communicate that imagery, that message to those identified audience? In the first instance, you need to understand the audience itself that you want to talk to. Because whether it's language, whether it's tonality, whether it's imagery, it's important that it will connect with them. Importantly, also, you need to understand the products. What makes it work? For us as a country, we have a country of very diverse and highly talented people. These are things we can build upon. Sometimes you must leave the country to appreciate the country. I was in a meeting, a presentation in Cape Town last year. I'll give you an example of the building blocks we can use. And there was a presentation on, on African pop music. And the presenter, South African, said to the group, the top 10 artists in Africa are on this list. Well, check that list. Something strange here. Only two of those listed, top 10, are not Nigerian. How are we driving this? So there are elements you can use in building blocks to say, look, we want to move from A to B. So agree what and who you want to be. Agree what elements are required to build that image. You know? And the image will be built not just by words, but by actions. So what are those things we are going to do as a country that Nigerians themselves will feel proud about their country? Feel proud to be called Nigerians anywhere, anytime. What are those things that we will do that once a foreigner sets foot in our country, or in fact encounters any Nigerian, he feels that this, this is a country of great people, great nation. What do we do that as our kids grow up, and we go back to the issue of education, history, civics. What do we do that as we build a new generation of Nigerians, they feel that, yes, this is my home and I can't go anywhere else? You'd be surprised how many young people I have sat down and begged them, do not move to Canada. <laughs> it's, easier to, it's easier to go abroad than to come back. It's a dead end. Mm. So, hey, Olga, it's, all, it's good enough for you. you you've made it. But they, can't, they see no future. Before it used to be Nigerians who could make no... Great to have you back here on the Morning Show on the Rise News. Ms. Saudeme Ufort is still with us in the studio, Group Managing Director, SO and U Group. You're talking about the buy-in uh, from Nigeria. But my next question to you is, should this be a top-bottom approach or a bottom-top approach? Because do our, Nigerians have a role to play in this, apart from leadership. We don't know the role leadership needs to play, and you've talked about the qualities of yeah. leaders mm -hmm. to push this. But how about Nigerians themselves? Mm. Should this be a top-bottom or bottom-top approach? Um, how do we get the buy-in of the Nigerians themselves? Yes. Leadership. Leadership? Yes. Mm. It must be, you see, it must be, be top-down. Why? Why? Leadership must set the agenda, communicate that agenda to the people, Paint a vision, a common vision that we can all share, that is attractive and worth aspiring to. Sell it to the people. If the vision is attractive enough and leader is credible enough and has a compelling message, to mobilize the people. That's why I said when I first heard about leadership, mm -hmm. inspiration is key. You know, integrity, commitment having the right values. Once some people believe in you, and you can paint this, how did Lee Kuan Yew do it in Singapore? How about how did others do it? You need to paint a mind picture, which is the vision. You say, look, this is where we should be. If you are here, this is a benefit to us as a nation. Is it attractive enough? If it is, they'll get on board. You then pull back to begin to mobilize them to create those messages that will get them to get up and go. And it's not rocket science. Other countries have done it. Even in this country, we've had some attempts as such. I still go back that probably, probably, our best attempt at social mobilization 
was under the same President Buhari as a military head of state. Why? It was short-lived. But even after that regime was ousted, Nigerians still saw it of value to Q. The Q culture remained for a while. Mm. So once you mobilize, have, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's not that simple. It's a fairly complex strategic, you know, uh, program. It would work. Nigerians want good things. And if they see a man that will lead them to those good places, they will go with the fellow. You mentioned earlier that it's not about building infrastructure. Yes. And then you've also talked about um, Nigerian youth going to Canada in their droves and how yeah. you've tried to you know, persuade some not to go. But you have a country where there's no electricity, mm. there's insecurity, the uh, inflation is on the rise, the interest rates on loans is not business friendly. Yeah. How do you sell that to a Nigerian youth to say, you know, there is a country and you have to buy into it because if you don't, it won't change. How do you sell that? Well, I said to them in the first instance, those countries they're running to were built by people. If you look closely at their histories, they've gone through worse situations. You have to start somewhere. We may not have the best we can have in leadership today, but will it be forever? No. Let our best brains stay here. Let's, as we say in straight parlance, rough it out together. At the end of the day, we can make a difference. If all of us commit towards a better Nigeria, there will be a better Nigeria. I, as a CEO, I will launcher in so many areas of social service. You know, because it's my own way of contributing towards changing Nigeria. If our young people look inwards and say, okay, these are temporary obstacles, if I apply myself, I can And they're really temporary. You have a nation filled with youth, <laughs> but the old people still rule and determine the future of the young people. Again, I disagree. Let the young people prove that they can take charge and that they go in this space. I'll take myself as an example. Hmm? I remain, till date, the youngest ever president of the Association of Advertising Agencies of Nigeria. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Mm. I was just over 38. Before my tenure, the average age for a president was the late 50s or their 60s. Who were the guys that supported me to run? The elders of the profession. You know, Achebe said it all. When a child washes his hands well. He dines with the elders. The elders. Let me, let me segue in there. Same Chino Achebe wrote his last book and said there was a country. Mm. And a lot of people in the public space, when they still look at the narrative of Nigeria, they still mm. refer to that book. They still say, obviously, there was something Chino Achebe was seeing we're not, we're not seeing now. From when Chino Achebe wrote that book, sort of like his parting shot, because mm -hmm. he, he passed a couple of years after writing that book. Yeah. Things have got worse. It was actually a base suitsayer. <laughs> Sometimes things need to get worse before they get better. Chino Achebe had the privilege at that time of his life to reflect feel a bit frustrated about what he was seeing mm. and maybe be a bit uh, fatalistic or, you know, despondent. But for people of our age and even younger, we have no other country than Nigeria. Actually, was on his way out and probably feeling concerned for his children. But was, for most of the time, he lived outside of the, outside of the country. Mm. For the next generation, they can make this country a better place. I'll also take you on this. Sam Achebe in the 60s wrote yeah. a book called The Man of the People, mm -hmm. where he sort of predicted the coup in Nigeria. In fact, he was a, the military regime that wanted to arrest him because the narration in that book looked as though Achebe had seen the future and exactly what played out in The Man of the People played out in the national space. It was sort of like a national deja vu. So a lot of people look and say, Achebe is cocksure when he talks. And when you read the book, there was a country. 
same factors Achebe talked about. Was it a clarion call we missed after Achebe wrote that book? You see, we, we have a choice. Look at the signs around us as Captain Achebe's book and retrace our steps to do the right things. And the outcome can be different from Achebe's narrative. Or we have, hopefully not the other choice, mm. of continuing the way we are going. Mm. You see, if you are going downhill, what you do is you, you pull back and get back on track. And um, I think that Nigeria is resilient enough. We are smart people. We know what is good for us. And I repeat, this is a passing phase. I have absolute confidence in Nigeria and Nigerians that we can pull back from the brink. This is not irretrievable. I am confident that with the right leadership and the commitment from all, we can make a difference. And let's be very clear among ourselves. Sometimes I said, you need to get to the bottom to wake up and smell the coffee. But a lot of people will say, we're getting to the bottom. We can't get the leadership that will pull us out because look at the process that throws up the leaders. It's pretty much a selection. Uh, to sound a little very classical now, we don't have men of substance that have drank from the limpid waters of asepsis any longer in this country. That the reason why other nations can stand tall is because the, the process that produces leadership is a process that screens for the best. Take England, for instance. Almost every prime minister in recent times. Oxford. You must have gone to Ethan, yeah. Oxford. You must have even studied a course called PPE, Politics, Philosophy, and Economics, before you can be prime minister. Boris Johnson, Oxford. Theresa May. Oxford. Cameron. Cameron, <laughs> Oxford. Go back uh, to uh, Tony Blair, Oxford. Go back to Margaret Thatcher, Oxford. The best of the world. But our system here minimum does. Minimum education requirement. Minimum education requirement does not produce the best of the world. So are you saying we, we are ready, sir? I think we are. I, I still think we are being a bit unfair to ourselves. Mm -hmm. the, the nations you've mentioned, their level of, you know, they've evolved. Level of sophistication is different from ours. You see, in Nigeria, it, somehow you have two nations in one. And um, there are areas of very high levels of sophistication. There are also areas that are not so sophisticated, you know? And the level of thinking will be informed by this level of sophistication that you have. My view is that change will come one person at a time, door to door, community by community. Some parts of Nigeria will lead that change. And when they lead that change, they'll become so prosperous in every aspect of their operations. The first step to deliver that is restructuring through federalism that frees up the different parts of Nigeria to decide for themselves how they want to be, how they want to grow, whilst contributing to the center. When that happens, you begin to find parts of Nigeria that will become the benchmark for others. And I'll repeat again, it boils down to all of us to make a difference. Why do I say this? Let's look at the last elections. Again, I fall back to where I come from in our quiet bomb states. We had a situation where a crisis was brewing politically. Somebody came on the scene and threatened the people with Warsaw that he would crush and effectively declared war on his own people. You know what happened in that quiet bomb? Why the elections went the way it went? The people said, no, we won't allow this. Beyond just the local people, you actually found people of very high standing in society living outside of the states 
acquiring professionals in Abuja and Lagos saying, no, you cannot take us backwards. They moved to their communities. And I can tell you up front, in the three months of elections I was in my community, at least every fortnight. And what you find in this community is that the people are vulnerable. They don't know where to go. All that it requires is someone that they can respect, someone credible to say, this is the way to go. And they will go. They're waiting for it. Mm. So let us not be elitist in our mindset. Okay, I'm coming. Okay, okay. Be before you land, we'll, 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 we'll just segue into a quick break very soon. I will talk more about this. I will also come back to talk about you know, the things you did in Acquire Bomb, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the last lap of the morning show here on Niraj News. Mr. Odema Ufot is still with us. Uh, thank you for staying with us. Mm. You were talking about the vulnerability of the Acquire Bomb people during the elections, but there were those professionals in Lagos and Abuja that had to come back and stamp their foot. You were one of them. What did you do differently? Because Acquire Bomb seems to be the Perfect story now. Well, almost perfect story. Perfect child, as it were. Yes, and there's something different that has been done in Aquibom. The very first state to have its own air, yeah. airline, Udom Air. Ibom Air. Ibom Air, Air. sorry. <laughs> Ibom Air. What did you do differently in The Aquibom? very first state to have its own eco building. Mm -hmm. The first of its kind in Africa. What has been done in Aquibom state that other states can replicate? Well, I think it goes back to leadership. Uh, you have a man who came into office with a commitment that um, for him it would be about performance. He takes governance as serious business. And he wants to ensure he makes, he makes a change before he leaves. Maybe if we, if we go back to even his emergence, um, his sponsor at the time, who happens to be his political godfather, Senator uh, Gospel Akwabio had said to us when he presented Udo Emmanuel to us that he, he does not want to be known as the best governor of Akwabio State. He wants to be known, that's Akwabio saying this, mm -hmm. as the governor that brought the best governor to Akwabio State. And I think Udo Emmanuel has gone into service with that mindset. He comes from a, a business background. And so he says to everyone that cares to listen, governance is serious business. We must make a, an impact, industrialize. Our people can't depend on all process forever. Let's industrialize. You will be amazed at the number of industries that are coming up. People are saying, well, there are small industries. No. The small industries are the easiest to implement. They're the easiest to manage. By having something in every community, you can begin to amplify from simple ones to the more complex ones, because they are easier to, to, to start and to grow. Now, he's won the confidence of the people. Here is a state that in 2011, for four years, I could not set foot in the states. Like my other friends, many of us who had families living there, who had parents there, moved our parents to neighboring Calabar because of fear of kidnapping and robbery. In the four years of Udo Emmanuel, there has been peace. There cannot be prosperity without peace and security. And that's why we faulted the issue of the leasing of the state as insecure. You know, and we said, some, some of us even say, is it enemy action or what? <laughs> so he has ensured that there's peace, there's security, and there's harmony. The, the, the state is built on a tripod of Ibibio, Anang, and Oron. Five years ago, there was tension between these three key units of the state. Today, those schisms are essentially gone because the governor says, I am governor of all. Even in his Christianity, he says, I don't belong to any church. I go to every church. So deliberately, to send the right message, Every Sunday, his SA religious affairs says to him, Excellency, this Sunday we are worshipping in this church. So he attends different churches attends, on yeah, Sundays. Because he wants to reach out to his people. He doesn't want to be pigeonholed into a particular mindset. But beyond this is the issue of investment. 
It's a massive investment drive because the only way you can pull the people out of poverty is through industrialization to create jobs and create economic and financial empowerment. So he will say to you, anyone I care to listen, if you bring an investor into my state at 4 a.m., wake me up, I will see him. Mm. So what has happened in Africa is that the governor has won the confidence and the trust of the people. And that's what leaders need to do. And so therefore, when something happens, and it looks like there's about to be a reversal of the peace, security, and the emerging prosperity of the state, people who are well-meaning, who care for the state, must rise up and say, no, we'll let it happen. Well, you say emerging prosperity, but according to the National Bureau of Statistics, uh, Kwaipom still has one of the highest level of unemployment in the country, if not the highest level of unemployment. Now, you build it brick by brick. You are looking at a society where people were used to handouts. Huge old money. And the fashion was simple handouts. They called it empowerment, mm. you know? The money that we were using under Bugos empowerment schemes to hand out 200,000 here, Mm. If that money had been used, the number of industries that have been built in the last four years, if in the eight years of the full administration, half of that had been done, we would not be so poor. So my view is that under the government's competition agenda, let us see, by 2023, where will our choir be? And I can assure you, we will be miles ahead. By God's grace. Mm. Speaking in broader terms, Aqua Album is, is, is doing fairly good. Uh, we, we've heard that message. Thank you have the brand you. ambassador for Aqua Album here. But let's talk in broader terms. We are awaiting President Mohamed Buhari's cabinet. Um, we've just had the CBN governor roll out his five year plans. Um, what should be the direction of this government? And what do you want to see in that cabinet when it is finally announced and formed? I'd like to see a strong economic team, number one. Number two, the economic team can do so much. I'd like to see a real commitment at the highest levels of government to decisions of the economic team, a real will to implement what has been recommended, and some attempt at mobilizing and galvanizing, first, the people in government to tow the path that will take us out of our economic situation. And then secondly, a clear plan to governance the Nigerian people to align and support that economic plan. You know, the era GP was launched. Great idea, great attempts at mobilizing, but it just wasn't enough. And my take also that there wasn't enough support of that plan at the highest levels of government. Whatever support there may have been, would have been essentially lip service, I'm afraid. So what I'd like to see is a strong economic, our biggest problem right now, yeah, corruption is an issue. We've seen all that happen. But sometimes you must look pragmatically at situations. Mm. When a civil servant earns a wage that just doesn't take him home, mm. is that a blueprint for corruption? That's a blueprint for where we will live it today, <laughs> but definitely we'll have a lot more to talk about. I'd like to say a very big thank you to you, sir, thank Mr. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much, you sir. Thank you very much. And that's been the show. I am Adesua Moroin. And I'm Rafael Yusei. Goodbye. <laughs>